In total, we employ more than 22,000 US workers. If you take into account our Nissan and Infinity retail network, tens of thousands of additional workers count on Nissan North America for their livelihood. Here in Chicago, we have a sizable operation as our Midwest region is headquartered in Aurora with responsibility for sales and marketing activities throughout the Midwest. Our Chicago regional team also manages the relationship with our 28 dealer network here in Chicagoland, who employ more than 2,000 workers and generated more than $1.5 billion in revenue last year. In total, Nissan and our dealers contributed more than $25 million to local Chicago advertising last year and generated additional impact through community involvement and charitable contributions. Yet, our story is much deeper than how a multinational company benefits from doing business in this country. We are a success story that is a template for a U.S. manufacturing resurgence. 31 years ago, our first Made in America automobile rolled off a U.S. assembly line, a white Nissan pickup truck, at our plant in Smyrna, Tennessee. The fact that a foreign car plant existed in the southern United States was unheard of at the time. And that first year, we produced nearly 20,000 vehicles for U.S. consumers. Last year, Smyrna produced more than 648,000 vehicles and was the top producing automotive plant in North America. Let me say that again. Nissan's manufacturing plant in Tennessee produced more vehicles last year than any other automotive plant in North America, foreign or domestic. And the story that took us from that first American-made Nissan truck 31 years ago to the country's top producing plant today says as much about the opportunity that American manufacturing offers as it does about Nissan's commitment to the US. More than that, however, our story stands as a model of how bold vision and forward thinking in both the public and private sectors is needed to bring more and more good manufacturing jobs back to America. I'd like to share some observations in this regard and comment on some best practices that can help boost the middle class to foster a vibrant, prosperous US manufacturing workforce. It comes down to three distinct yet interwoven areas of focus. Localized production, workforce training, and capitalizing on the nation's changing demographics. Let's begin with localization. <clears throat> Two years ago, the New York Times ran a story titled In Pursuit of Nissan, a jobs lesson for the tech industry. So how is that we only built our first auto domestically three decades ago, yet we are held up as a model for others in terms of creating more and more good jobs right here in the US. It comes down to having size and opportunity. Nissan made a strategic investments in its US operations to ensure the company is able to continue to build quality vehicles that meet the growing needs of US consumers. Over the years, we continually expanded our manufacturing capacity to support future growth. And with each wave of investment, the growth followed. But importantly, it too was followed by another wave of investment. It is a virtuous cycle, the gift that keeps on giving. We currently enjoy our largest US presence since Nissan sold its first automobile in America in 1958. Last year, Nissan North America set all-time records for total sales, U.S. production, and exports from our U.S. plants. Due to our localization efforts, we sold more than one million North America produced vehicles in the U.S. for the very first time. We exported our one millionth U.S. assembled vehicle, and we pushed our U.S. workforce to a record 22,000 American jobs, including 16,000 of those in manufacturing. With the addition of more than 9,000 new team members since mid-2011. I believe the term here is Big Mo. Any way you look at it, Nissan North America is gaining big momentum. 
That's not just good for us, it's also good for the American worker and the US economy. Nissan's record-setting performance in 2014 is attributable to a more than 10 billion investment in American operations since the start of US manufacturing in 1983. When the Smyrna plant opened its door more than 30 years ago, it was a groundbreaking moment, bringing auto production to Tennessee for the first time and inspiring other auto companies and suppliers to follow Nissan's lead and set up operations throughout the South. Since that time, the Smyrna plant and its sister plants in Decker, Tennessee, and Canton, Mississippi, have been a force for economic development, creating thousands of well-paying jobs, boosting local economies, and creating a winning model for others to follow. Our four U.S. manufacturing facilities have produced more than 13.7 million vehicles, 7.6 million engines, and 57,000 lithium-ion battery packs. And we are now capable of producing more than 1 million vehicles, nearly 2 million engines, and nearly 2 million additional engine parts annually. Localization remains an important part of Nissan's strategy in North America. The closer to the markets the manufacturing is, the more responsive we can be, a key to remaining competitive. In total, we're now manufacturing 85% of the vehicles we sell in the US right here in North America, up from 69% just a few years ago. Just last November, the all new 2015 Nissan Murano crossover became the first Murano and the eighth vehicle assembled at our Canton, Mississippi vehicle assembly plant. The 11 year old plant became the global source for Murano production, creating export opportunities to export markets around the world. The eight vehicles assembled in Canton represent the most diverse production portfolio of any manufacturer's assembly plant in North America and stands as a testament to Nissan's manufacturing versatility. In addition to having our vehicle production capacity in place locally, Nissan is also focused on supporting the capacity of our suppliers locally. Our recent market growth and investment in our U.S. manufacturing operations gives our suppliers and their investors the confidence to expand as well. In an effort to support the localization efforts of our suppliers, Nissan developed strategies that include locating suppliers inside our manufacturing facilities or investing in suppliers' parks adjacent to our plants. In cases when neither of these strategies is appropriate, we encourage suppliers to locate their production as close to our plants as possible. A recent example is our new 100 million supplier park supporting 800 quality jobs. It recently opened next door to our Canton, Mississippi plant. The project provides essential space to support the on-site suppliers necessary for continued growth, while further supporting Nissan's overall strategy to transfer more production and the jobs that go with it to the United States. The new facility is a key component to the long-term sustainability of our U.S. business and serves as another example of how public-private partnerships drive innovation and economic development. As we close in on Nissan's goal of 10% of the U.S. automotive market, we're carefully considering our next waves of investment. Remember what I said earlier, that each wave of investment was followed by another wave of growth so we are ready to capitalize on the opportunity. Localization has proven to be a smart and stable strategy for Nissan, but we've learned that it must work in concert with a plan to train team members in order to create a quality workforce. Today's automobile packs more computing power than the Apollo astronauts relied on to walk the moon and return safely to Earth. And yet the next generation of internal combustion electric, and even the emerging business of autonomous vehicles will take on board technology to far higher levels. At the same time, our innovation in design and manufacturing is also evolving at an astounding pace. Our workforce must evolve as well, and they've proven they're up to the task so long as the right tools and training to succeed are provided. That's why we need to reimagine our approach to workforce training and development. 
Our world is different today. Our products and technologies are different too. So we need to think and act differently about how best to retain, recruit, and train manufacturing employees with an eye toward the future. The December jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics showed an increase of over 250,000 jobs, with manufacturing employment increasing by 17,000 in the month. On average, the manufacturing sector added 16,000 jobs per month in last year, compared to an average gain of 7,000 jobs per month in 2013. Even in the midst of the resurgent phase of growth for American manufacturing automakers are increasingly challenged by a shortage of skilled workers to fill key openings necessary for ramping up production to meet growing consumer demand. Nissan is no stranger to these challenges. Production increases of more than 254% at our U.S. facilities since mid-2011 require that we add 9,000 jobs, identifying and hiring individuals with the requisite experience in skilled trades and engineering, and applicants qualified in the maintenance of advanced manufacturing technology has proven difficult and poses a serious threat to our ability to reach 10% market share in North America in the near term. But now, more than ever, we're looking to our state partnerships to join us in making necessary investments in workforce development and education to increase the number of skilled manufacturing workers to fill available jobs and fuel future expansion efforts. States have been quick to recognize that tying the training and skills that colleges are teaching directly to the current workforce needs of local businesses will help more citizens qualify for good paying high quality jobs. Just last month, here in Illinois, Governor Rauner led a grand opening ceremony at Harper College Career and Technical Education Center. It's a $38 million public-private project that offers training programs in fields such as manufacturing, welding, architectural technology, and public safety. It is this type of innovation that sets the U.S. next generation workforce up for success. Closer to home for Nissan, we are encouraged to see a strong commitment to education programs like Tennessee Governor Haslam's Drive to 55, which focuses on increasing the number of Tennesseans with college degrees. A key part of this initiative, Tennessee Promise, provides two years of tuition-free community or technical college training to high school graduates. In Mississippi, Governor Bryant is pursuing a similar program to strengthen the manufacturing workforce in the state. The program provides financial assistance for students to pursue a community college tech program. In addition, the Mississippi Economic Development Council recently launched an award program that recognizes students who take at least four career tech classes in high school. These efforts by state partners to make their workers more skilled more trainable and more competitive are paying dividends and should attract even more manufacturers to consider setting up shop in those areas with a skilled workforce and with local and state officials who understand the mutual benefit of such forward-thinking investments. These programs have been effective at creating a pipeline of talent for our business, but we must do much more and I'm encouraged by recent progress. Ongoing efforts with state partners to develop curricula to meet the needs of our workforce are already helping overcome some of these workforce challenges. To accelerate efforts to find and train workers, Nissan and the state of Tennessee recently joined forces to build a state-of-the-art education and training facility adjacent to our vehicle assembly plant. This public-private partnership will provide training programs aimed at preparing workers for jobs in advanced manufacturing, such as engineering, robotics, and manufacturing maintenance. The new training center is a key component to the long-term sustainability and continued growth of our business in Tennessee, and another testament to the state's commitment to advancing business through education. It will also develop a pipeline of skilled workers for our Tennessee manufacturing operations and critical opportunities 
for current and prospective employees to learn valuable skills in advanced manufacturing. The skills, I'm at that, that are transferable far beyond Nissan. Employees will benefit from hands-on training with skilled trades that can be directly applied to work in Nissan's Tennessee automotive plants or with one of our many suppliers in the region. Furthermore, Nissan is making direct investments in the workforce of tomorrow through a high net support of STEM initiatives and technical education training programs. We provide financial support to many local, regional and national organizations to develop STEM programs for kids in elementary, middle and high schools as well as college activities. Our efforts are geared toward exposing kids and teens, especially young women, to the infinite possibilities of having a solid STEM education and that it's not just about becoming an engineer, working in a lab or building robots. It's about developing versatile skills that are in high demand in today's modern global marketplace. All of these efforts are helping a multinational company like Nissan to continue to want to invest in US manufacturing. But many challenges remain for Nissan and other companies looking to follow our guide path, which brings us to demographics. An undeniable fact is that the face of the American consumer is changing. Companies in the US and around the globe must adapt if we want to remain competitive. If they can attain it, diversity may be the single biggest competitive advantage for companies moving forward. It's not only a smart thing to do, it's the right thing to do. It's not accident that Nissan has the most diverse consumer base of any automotive manufacturer with 36% of our buyers being ethnically diverse. We understand that to stay relevant in today's marketplace is crucial to be in touch with each unique consumer group in a genuine way and to incorporate this into the core of our marketing plans. For example, we know that many Latinos are bilingual or Spanish first, so Nissan was one of the first in the industry to provide consumers with bilingual tools to interact with the brand at various touch points. This includes a Spanish language website and various in-language social media platforms that to this day are among the automotive industry's most engaging channels for multicultural consumers. As value conscious consumers, ads that feature product information and utility resonate well among Asian Americans more so than any other ethnic group. Ads featuring culturally relevant situations and characters make up 65% of top ads among Asian Americans. Knowing this, we recently launched a non-traditional campaign that reaches the Asian American millennial consumers. This group is strongly influenced by word of mouth so we partner with four popular Chinese and Taiwanese American celebrities and pair each of them with the Nissan vehicle that best captures his or her unique personality. These videos, filmed on location in New York City, introduce young Asian American consumers to the Nissan brand and products through individuals that they admire and with whom they can more personally relate. With more work to do, no doubt, Nissan is making good progress in ensuring that our workforce diversity better reflects those who are purchasing our products in the marketplace. Over time, this is an area we feel will be an increasingly competitive advantage for Nissan, at which other companies uh, will have to pay particular attention to moving forward. I'd like to close by saying that I'm proud of the success that Nissan's US operations have experienced, particularly most recently. As you can see here, Nissan enjoyed steady growth in the US market in 12 out of the last 15 years, an outstanding performance when you consider the ups and downs of the economy in general and the auto industry in particular. Yet, when you overlay the graph of our manufacturing investment onto this chart, it's clear that none of this would have been possible without three things. Investment in localized manufacturing, expanding workforce training, 
and understanding demographic shifts. It's been more than 60 years since that Nissan engineer had his teeth knocked out on his first trip to the US. He was scrappy and undeterred, as was Nissan, and we remain so today. Watch this space, because if you thought Nissan did well in the US in the past 60 years, growing our US market share, investing in local communities, and providing good jobs, just wait to see what the next chapters reveal. Our story is the American story, and there is so much more to come. Thank you very much. So I have all sorts of automobile questions here, but, but I've got to start with a nuclear engineer becoming, uh, running car companies. Like, <laughs> did you just want to make really fast cars? How, how did you get there? It's a, it's a love affair. So uh, I, um, I was a successful uh, nuclear engineer in, in Spain, and I wanted to buy a car. So uh, <laughs> a friend of mine told me, uh, you need to go to this dealership. So I said, I, I don't like the brand. She said, you don't care about the brand. Wait and see the sales manager. She became my, my wife after some time. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I, I came into this industry. So uh, now she cannot uh, blame me when I'm never at home because I'm always uh, in meetings like this, uh, which I enjoy. So she's the one who put me in this industry. That's great. I won't ask what brand it was. <laughs> it was a very exciting video to, in, in your talk to hear about the, the evolution of the, the story of Nissan in, in the U.S. How do you think about the brand? Certainly the brand has evolved over the years. But how do you think about the future of the brand here, and, and what's your vision of where, how that can evolve? So to me, uh, the brand has gone through uh, ups and downs, uh, and uh, we've seen uh, the, the history uh, since 1999. But before that, we've been one of the pioneers uh, in, in the U.S. with the introduction of Datsun. If you ask uh, those who knew about Datsun, uh, they will tell you that uh, the Datsun brand has uh, had a very high consideration uh, and it was very much linked to uh, performance. So when uh, Datsun became Nissan, <coughs> there was some, uh, I would say, adjustment time uh, that I think that hopefully uh, with time it's mm -hmm. picking up again. And when we are in uh, auto shows like uh, the one in Chicago, and we present the LMP1 uh, car, which is really loyal to our roots, I think people are realizing that we are back again, that uh, uh, our consideration is going to really continue to grow, and with the great job that our products, our engineers, our management, uh, and our dealers are doing, I'm very, very confident that we're going to continue to see a steady growth in the years to come. That's great. Speaking of the dealers, I, I was told that you have some changes in dealer practices that you're starting to work on that will, that will improve the, the customer experience. Can you talk about your, your plans for that? Well, we have a lot of uh, new practices which are uh, easy to tell uh, but di difficult to do. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, refer to uh, Jeff Rosen, uh, who is the president of the Nissan Dealer Association, uh, sitting uh, in, in the front table, who happens to be uh, one of our best dealers in the Midwest area, uh, based in uh, Chicago. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, he and the rest of the members of the Dealer Advisory Board have been very helpful into uh, creating a, a work, a way to work together, which is very intense, uh, but it's uh, very effective, which in turn uh, makes us see us at least two to three days per month, no matter where we are in the world, in order to continue to work and to um, uh, evolve uh, together. So this has been, uh, I would say, the core, the core of everything that is happening. And I would say two of the key uh, uh, results of that partnership uh, have been the so-called sales growth plan, mm -hmm. uh, which we launched uh, as a suggestion of the dealer advisory board, uh, and uh, aim at increasing sales and profitability for both uh, the dealers and Nissan. And now we are uh, shifting <coughs> into what we call the quality growth plan, which is uh, the second but not less important part of uh, the relationship uh, with our dealers in order to maximize the quality of the service that we provide to uh, our uh, customers through our dealers. So we're really very bullish. We're about to launch it. Nice, nice. You told me at lunch that part of what drove you really to, no pun intended, that to the uh, automotive industry is you like competition. So 
who do you see as the as the competition? You know, Toyota after the recalls is is coming back. Hyundai has made a lot of progress. Who who do you worry about? What do you think the competition? Well, is? I worry about every single one. Uh, every single car that is not a Nissan is a competitor uh, sale, and uh, I worry about every single one, which uh, it also uh, uh, is seen as a huge opportunity because we see how many uh, other cars are sold in the US, so meaning a, a huge opportunity. <clears throat> we respect all the competitors, and particularly in this market, you, can, you cannot re disrespect anyone. So the Japanese are really a very, very strong, uh, and uh, this is the number one uh, market uh, for them. Now, uh, the domestics <clears throat> are super strong, and this is the most important market uh, for them as well. But then you get also Koreans uh, that are really strong and they want this to become the number one market. And the Europeans. So there is nobody missing. So everyone is, uh, I would say, the enemy. And uh, we, need to, we need to fight to be the winners in this environment. It, it, it's, an, it's an incredible st statement about the U.S. market. I, I just was finished reading Geithner's book about the recession. And you know, going through, do we bail out the automotive industry? And it wasn't too many years ago that two of your competitors were in bankruptcy, Chrysler and GM. I think sales dropped to less than 10 million and 9 million roughly in the US and they're back, what are they? What are their um, almost record levels I think last year. Is that, that's amazing. Does that surprise you in this market? <clears throat> well, this is what happens in the US. This is a, a, what you only understand when you are living, breathing and uh, you know, uh, doing business here. This is uh, still, and uh, to me, it will still be, for the years to come, the most important automotive market in the world. Any other market uh, that I've worked uh, in is not so uh, strong, is not able to provide uh, the levels of profit and investment that the US market is bringing. And that's why uh, uh, you, you just mentioned uh, strong manufacturers that were in trouble, <clears throat> they're coming back. Uh, and uh, I mentioned also that we are happy that they are back. Uh, because in our industry, if there is one element uh, that is um, uh, key, is the interdependency. Uh, nowadays, uh, most of the OEMs share uh, similar suppliers. Mm. So if uh, one OEM has a big trouble, a big problem, and then a supplier suffers because of that, then many others are affected. So you almost want to, to uh, I always say, win, but gently. Mm. So you, you cannot do too much because then uh, you may end up having trouble. So you want the industry to be healthy, you want everybody to do well, as is happening now, and still trying to gain share in this environment. And what's your projection for the U.S. market? Do you, do you think it'll continue to be this healthy? Uh, yes, <clears throat> we are very, very bullish. So um, we think uh, the market is going to continue to grow uh, for uh, this year that we just started. Projections vary between 16.7 uh, million uh, to 17 million. <clears throat> we are not only ready to grow, but we're investing to grow, mm -hmm. and we're doing plan plans to grow. Uh, today, one of the issues we face with some of our models is lack of capacity, uh, which we need to uh, compensate with uh, bringing additional capacity from other, other markets. So uh, we are confident, we believe uh, the market will continue to grow and, and we are ready to do so. Sometimes, <clears throat> you know, when you compare the growth in percentage with other markets, they don't look so big. But in absolute terms, and in terms of the revenue and profitability opportunity is way bigger than any other market today. And part of what's driving that you talked about is innovation, and there's innovation everywhere in, in automobiles. Are there two or three places that you're most excited about and you really enjoy the innovation? Is there a nuclear car coming? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I, I enjoy the most the innovation uh, today with the fully uh, electric vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is uh, the most innovative technology available today which everybody is used to because we all have uh, mobile phones and devices and iPads and everything. And then the, the idea and the fact that you get your car home, you uh, uh, charge it overnight, or that you can go to places and charge your car as you're having lunch or going to the supermarket, <clears throat> this is something unthinkable some years ago, and it's a reality uh, now. So we sold uh, 30,200 cars uh, in the US uh, of the Nissan Leaf last year. It's been an all-time record. We've sold uh, more than 200,000 electric vehicles within the Alliance, uh, Renault Nissan Alliance worldwide. So whilst 
some people are looking into the next technology. The most innovative technology now is this one. It works, it's highly <coughs> uh, high quality. I'm very proud to tell you that we uh, took the decision to invest in this technology two years ago. Some other manufacturers are talking about you know, things that they're going to do. Two years ago, we made a multi-million uh, investment in Smyrna, Tennessee. We're producing this car there. We are also producing the, the lithium ion batteries, which is like a lab, it's uh, unbelievable. And now we are working towards uh, the implementation of the autonomous driving, which to make it clear means uh, that <coughs> whilst you are sitting in the car, you can decide uh, not to pay attention to driving because you want to read a book or you want to read your emails, yet you want the car to uh, operate. So autonomous driving, which is not the same as driverless driving. And I think it's a very, very important, uh, 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 I would say, point, because in, in a recent statistic uh, that I read, <coughs> uh, although we all know that uh, the airplanes can uh, take off and fly and land wherever in the world, uh, without any, any pilot, mm -hmm. none of the people that were um, in the survey, including myself, were confident on getting into an airplane without a pilot. I don't know what would you do if um, you were in the same situation. So that's why we thought about it and we believe autonomous driving is the solution. And I, I read that your CEO has said uh, that by 2020, which is now five years away, you're going to have an autonomous car in the retail market. Is that still the plan? It is the plan. Our president and CEO, Mr. Carlos Gon, <coughs> is, I would say, uh, everybody knows, is the most senior uh, top executive in the automotive industry, more than 15 years uh, being CEO of uh, two uh, car companies, uh, one based in Paris, France, Renault, the other one based in uh, Yokohama, Nissan, mm -hmm but then a third one uh, uh, based in uh, Russia, Autovas. And uh, uh, yet he is fulfilling absolutely everything that he commits to. So he said he would introduce the uh, fully electric vehicle, the EV technology, and he did. And he said that he will introduce the autonomous driving by 2020, and he will. I guarantee you as a member of the executive committee of Nissan <coughs> that there are lots of works uh, in progress uh, to realize that technology. And I think that you should know that uh, the uh, research center that is developing that technology is in Silicon Valley, is uh, our alliance uh, R&D center, together with the one that we got in Michigan and the one we got in Arizona uh, that is developing that. So it's uh, thought, developed, engineered, and probably uh, sold. Uh, in the US too, so I'm very confident and stay tuned. I, I can't wait to get one of those so that I can do my emails while I'm driving. <laughs> I, I wanna switch topics very briefly for one last topic. You, you uh, spoke a lot about investing in people and workforce and working with community colleges and other educational institutions. Is that unique to the United States or does it differ in the United States compared to what Nissan has to do in other countries? Well, I've, I've got to say that because the U.S. market is so important and it's grow, it grows so much and there is so much investment going on, <coughs> uh, at times there is some scarce availability of uh, good talented engineers in the fields that we need or workforce. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned uh, today during my, my speech <coughs> that uh, training and investment in the right training uh, capabilities and the right quality workforce is key. So uh, we are working actively uh, with the different states where we have operations and we welcome other initiatives. I believe that this is one a key differentiating factor that while it uh, may be more challenging in the, in the US today than in other markets, is gonna become a strength because at the end of the day, the market which will have the most qualified, uh, best qualified workforce within the sector is the one that is going to attract uh, the, the work uh, the capacity and the investment. And perhaps that's the reason why we invested so far 10 billion uh, in the US, and that's why we're increasing our capacity and employees. Uh, let me tell you that it's a, it's a challenge. Those 9,000 employees that we uh, hired from 2011 uh, till today is being a real challenge because it's not just 9,000 people. Uh, they need to know what to do, they need to do it right, uh, and this is, a, I would say, a big challenge. Okay. I have one last question. Well, it's actually two parts. What car do you drive? 
Well, I, I've got the luxury to be able to change cars uh, almost every day, almost every day. <laughs> but uh, I must also tell you that I, I really uh, drive despite uh, I have the luxury of having a, a, um, a driver as well, but I drive by myself. And uh, the cars that I'm driving uh, lately are the QX80, mm -hmm. Infinity. Uh, I like uh, the Armada for the weekends. And because I've got two dogs uh, and they're very heavy, I drive um, a, also a Pathfinder, which has got a little bit uh, easier uh, way to access uh, them into the car. So those are the cars that I'm driving. And if you were to drive a non, if you were to drive a non Nissan car, no one will say anything. I, Don't worry. I got no it. doubts. I got <laughs> no no doubts. I would I would run. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great.